Martin. Um, Mr Speaker, I want to acknowledge the member who has just resumed her seat and particularly her comments about the high quality education system that we have in Canterbury, in fact in New Zealand, and also the um, commitment that she's made, and uh, likewise with the Prime Minister and Minister Jerry Brownlee, to the people of Canterbury who have been so displaced by the uh, series of earthquakes over 13,000. I, I don't recall seeing that member once acting or speaking, perhaps even thinking, in support of Phillipstown School, where that community, so strongly supported by that school, was threatened with closure. The community said to Minister Parata, we don't want our school to close. The neighbouring community said this is a fine school, it's got a great record. It was clear that the assessment that the Ministry of Education did on it was totally flawed, and not once did that member speak out in support of a local school under threat of closure within her own electorate. It's Christchurch Central electorate. I hope that on the 21st of September we'll be able to say Tony Milne's electorate, um, because he's the Labour candidate there. He will stand up for the residents of his electorate if he has the privilege of being elected. And I'll say more uh, about the citizens of Canterbury who have been so let down, not just by this budget. Uh, they didn't expect anything out of the budget, actually, because for over three years they have felt, felt tricked and let down and abandoned by the broken promises that John Key made. He came to Canterbury and he said, no one will be worse off. That's right. <laughs> That's a joke. But it's a very sad joke for people who have had to accept 2007 rateable valuation offers for their land and their, and their um, home. And if they don't have a home on their land, they've been offered 50% of the 2007 rateable valuation in compensation for the government compulsorily acquiring, acquiring that land and the same for commercial property. That, that is not making a truth out of the Prime Minister's statement that nobody would be worse off. Yeah, yeah. But Mr Speaker, I want to start by talking about housing. Fr frankly, I don't give a toss what the description is to the situation we are in, particularly in Canterbury, also in Auckland and in other parts of the country, in regard to housing. I don't care if we call it a crisis or if we just say people can't afford to rent a home and they can't afford to buy a home. If that isn't a crisis, let's not get bogged down in terminology. Why doesn't the government front up to the fact that, particularly in Canterbury and Auckland, but also in other parts of the country, people cannot afford to rent somewhere to live? That is not acceptable in our country. It shouldn't be acceptable to this government, but all they do as a response is say it's not a crisis, as if that solves the situation. In, in my electorate, I have a suburb called Limud. It's a nice suburb. All my suburbs actually are nice uh, in, in my electorate, but it's a low to middle income earning area and the rental properties are not excessive normally. I just had another look on Trade Me the um, Prime Minister's source of all reference and analysis, and got a bit of a random sample of the three-bedroomed homes for rent in Limud. H how much would a three-bedroomed home cost to rent, do you think? A low to middle income area in Canterbury? Uh, the member knows the area well. Uh, he's represented it as a city councillor in the past. $1,190 per week was one three-bedroomed home in Limud, another one was $1,015 per week, has got hot and cold running water inside the home, that's an advantage, and there was a bargain home, $799 per week, for rent in Limwood. This is not an expensive area. Uh, how do people afford that? How do people afford that? Well, the answer is they don't. They try and get into social housing. We have hundreds of homes wrecked, Social housing owned by the Christchurch City Council, and I, I hope owned in the future by Christchurch City Council. I'm very proud our council is the second biggest landlord in the country. But because the EQC payments haven't been resolved between Jerry Brownlee 
and the Christchurch City Council, those social housing units are boarded up, damaged, and have obviously have nobody living in them. And the same with Housing New Zealand stock. Hundreds of Housing New Zealand houses across our city empty and boarded up because Nick Smith hasn't put that as a priority to get those homes repaired. They're repairable, they're empty, and we've got people squashed into houses or living in garages or staying with friends moving constantly as they burn up their relationships with friends or relations. It's just not acceptable. I found another house in a suburb that I used to live in, in Heathcote. It's a, it's a magnificent suburb, uh, just under the Port Hills. A lot of people have been displaced in that, that suburb, firstly because of rockfall. Got a lot of rocks came down into the valley, and more recently um, the area has been very badly hit with floods. A two-bedroom house in Heathcote. Again, it's, this is not a high-income, top-of-the-market place. $1,120 to rent a two-bedroom home in Heathcote. Let's not worry about the description. Let's not worry about if it's a crisis or not. We have places that are being rented at prices that people cannot afford to pay. The market isn't working, and the government's walking away and abandoning people in our city. That is not what the Prime Minister promised. He said nobody would be worse off if you can't live in your own home and you can't afford to rent somewhere. <coughs> You're actually worse off, Mr Speaker. There is no debate about that. I want to move just on to another critical issue, and that's the issue of employment and training. We raised this issue immediately post actually the September 2010 quakes, and then again uh, more strongly directly with the Minister uh, after the February 2011 quake. We said there's going to be lots of work in our city. Why don't we start training young people now so that they will be qualified and have the skills as the recovery progresses, as the rebuild program rolls out, so that we will have trained Cantabrians able to do the work that's being needed. Didn't happen, didn't happen, didn't happen. Eventually, the government said we should put some money into apprenticeships. I applaud that move. It was a great move. Any investment in apprenticeships is good. It, it was just two years too late. So a lot of our young people couldn't get work because so many of our businesses have run down or closed, so they left town. We're becoming a city where the people who are there are either the few who are going to make a lot of money out of the recovery or people that just can't leave, have got no option. And that isn't the sort of mix that we should have. We want young people who are trained and committed to being part of the recovery and able to contribute in a practical way to the rebuild. So what was the great announcement the Prime Minister came up with, Mr Speaker? Prime Minister and Paula Bennett came out with recently, we're going to pay beneficiaries from all around the country $3,000 to come to Canterbury and get a job. Well, that's great that they're giving people on benefits extra money to get a job, but I'd like to see Canterburyans get preference with helping them get a job. They deserve it. They've been through the worst of times. Help them to step up to being part of the improving times. And, and the other question, what, you know, why, why not for local people? The other question is, where are these people going to live? And there is no answer at all to that. Mr Speaker, I just want to touch briefly on an issue particularly relevant to my electorate, and that's the issue of rockfall protection and the response that Jerry Brownlee has given. We've got beautiful houses that are at risk of being uh, damaged, obviously lives at risk as well because of the threat of rockfall and future earthquakes. There are engineering solutions for a large number of these properties. They're called rockfall fences, attenuators, buns, terracing, any number of geotechnical engineered solutions to make those houses safe. The geotech people say we should do it. The cost-benefit analysis says we should do it. The homeowners say they'd love to be back in their own home and community safe. One obstacle, and that's Jerry Brownlee. He has said no to rockfall protection to make those homes safe and livable. He has torn apart communities for no good reason, and ratepayers and taxpayers are paying the price for what I can only describe as vandalism. Those families should be supported to have rockfall protection structures put up 
and be able to live in their home. Likewise, the Port Hills uh, owners of red zone beer land still waiting for an offer. This budget Order. should have delivered answers Members for Tom those people. Good speech. Mr Speaker. I call Mark Mitchell. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Real honour to take a call. Um, and I just want to acknowledge...